So uh, welcome everyone. Uh, we're so happy that you're here. Um, so I think, so we can be very informal. We're a small group. And um, so what, I, what I'd like to do is just start and just quickly go around and have people introduce themselves and just say what you're currently doing and if you're, I guess if you're interested, if you're here because you're a prospective uh, applicant. Um, so we'll skip us, we're the faculty, because we'll get to us soon, but we'll start with all of you. Hi, um, my name is Ajiro or AG. I'm a second year Biostat student. Um, <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Anything else you want to say? Hi, my name is Sandy. Um, <laughs> I'm currently working um, as a coordinator at a health agency um, in um, in the financial district area. I'm just cool. interviewing patients and see how they're. Um, it's like more like quality assurance, basically. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome. Hi, um, I'm Ire. Uh, I'm a first year grad student here at NYU, and I s just switched my concentration out from global health to biostatistics. Great. Thank you. Because we're awesome. <laughs> my name is Dennis, and I'm also a second year biostat student. Um, I'm Sally. I'm a senior majoring in public health and, yep. and sociology. And sociology, and I'm <laughs> minoring in math. <laughs> I'm Sindhu. I'm a senior undergrad majoring in public health and biology. Great. Awesome. Okay. Um, gosh, this is really loud. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so welcome everyone. Uh, so I am Rebecca Bukensky. I'm the new chair of biostatistics here at the College of Global Public Health. Um, and so we um, wanted to have this event to sort of try to introduce ourselves to anyone who might be uh, in the area and interested in biostatistics, and we want to tell you everything we can in a short amount of time about um, our field, what we do, what people do who are biostatisticians, um, and what our program is all about. And then you'll hear from Zach, who's standing back there, who uh, is the head of our admissions um, office, and he can tell you a lot more about details of applying. And then we, as you heard, we have current students here uh, who can also talk to you about their experiences. So we're gonna keep this really informal, so feel free to interrupt. So the plan is we're gonna start, um, the five of us uh, will just introduce ourselves, tell you like a minute about our research and our projects that we work on and our teaching and educational activities. And then Melody uh, will talk about our MPH program and our soon-to-be-approved MS program. Um, and then Zach, as I said, will talk about admissions and financial aid. Okay. All right. So this is me um, and my background. Uh, I was a math major, uh, undergraduate, and then my PhD is in statistics. Uh, one thing that came up in, in discussion is um, differences or not differences between statistics and biostatistics, so we can talk about that. Um, and I can tell you that nowadays there's very little difference um, other than the focus of the applications. Back in the day when I was uh, getting my PhD, there were bigger differences, but now not so much. Um, and I just, as I mentioned, I just started here. I was at Harvard School of Public Health for 24 years. Um, and I just started here in October, and I'm really excited to be here. It's a new school. The school is three years old, and, um, and of course, a new department, and we're growing, and we're increasing our faculty and our students and building up our course offerings. So we're in a growth mode in every respect, so it's a really exciting time to be here. Um, so just a little tiny background on my research. So my major research area is in statistical methodology in an area called survival analysis. Uh, some of you might be familiar with it. Anybody? You? No. Okay, so um, survival analysis is just referring to a certain kind of data structure in which there are incomplete observations. So we don't get to observe every subject until they have their event. Sometimes they get cut off because the study ends. 
we still want to use that information. That's what survival analysis is. So that's the major area that I work in. I'm actually teaching a new course uh, in a plot called Applied Survival Analysis in the spring, so I'm excited about that. Clinical trials is another area that I've worked on uh, going back to my dissertation. Uh, so I've worked on methods for the design of innovative and efficient clinical trials. Um, I'm always interested in issues of statistical inference. So we just had a, a journal club for our students a couple weeks ago. We read uh, the American Statistical Association's statement on p-values, uh, which are really important uh, in doing statistical analysis and what does that all mean. So that's another area that I like to think about and write about every now and then. Um, and the collaborative uh, work that I do has been in many different areas in medicine, uh, and mainly in Alzheimer's disease recently. So uh, I've worked in a lot of different contexts in Alzheimer's disease, and a lot of the work that I've done in survival analysis has been motivated by studies uh, in Alzheimer's disease. So that's the way everything ties together. Um, these are just different projects that I've worked on. Uh, so again, just supporting the, the survival analysis research, the Alzheimer's research. Um, and again, they're all tied together. So like this last project is called Treatment of Randomly Censored Covariates in Alzheimer's Disease Studies. So that's combining um, different different complexities in regression analysis uh, that arise due to incomplete observations um, that first I first became aware of in doing, uh, in my collaborations in Alzheimer's disease. Um, so teaching, I told you about the survival analysis class that I'm hoping that I will be able to teach. Uh, we just started a journal club for our students and the students and Dennis uh, can speak more to this. Um, because he's leading the journal club on Friday. The students seem very interested in that. Um, so I'm, you know, we're working to engage our students in, um, you know, in all kinds of learning, whether it's for credit or not for credit, uh, but learning the field and really being engaged and uh, involved in reading um, and talking about statistical issues. Um, and um, let's see, seminar on. Um, so let me skip to the next one. So another thing that I do is I'm the statistical editor for um, a major clinical journal in neurology that's called Annals of Neurology. And so uh, that's another activity that I engage in. And it, it makes me, again, aware of statistical complexities, which to statisticians to, who do research are what is very interesting and what we like to work on. And always, I've always, um, you know, been very, very involved and engaged in outreach to students from diverse and underrepresented backgrounds. That's a really high priority of mine and will be and is of, of our department here. Okay, so that's me and we'll talk more. But let me turn it over to Melody. Hi, I'm Melody Goodman. Um, I'm an associate professor. Um, I did my undergraduate work at Stony Brook University, majoring in applied mathematics and statistics and economics. Um, and then I did my graduate work, um, getting my um, master's and PhD at Harvard. Um, I run. Can you see? Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I run. I don't have my glasses on. That's the issue. <laughs> I run the measurement, learning, and evaluation lab. Um, so I'm really interested in um, conducting mixed methods research, really thinking about how we measure things and creating new measures for um, things that um, don't exist. Um, all of my work really focuses on health disparities, primarily racial and ethnic disparities um, in health across a broad range of disease outcomes, and I do a fair bit of survey um, research. Um, and I think I'm really sort of unique in this way as a statistician, but I'm really interested in engaging other stakeholders in research, because I think um, it's important that we involve those who are going to be impacted and trying to develop solutions um, for the problems that we're trying to address. So, Overall, I think my research really seeks to understand the social risk factors that contribute to health disparities, particularly in urban areas, and really trying to develop solutions, um, working collaboratively with others to address those issues that we identify. Um, I have several funded projects. So I have a um, project from the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute, um, and it's to develop a survey tool that assesses the level of stakeholder engagement in research studies from the stakeholder perspective. Um, and we're really trying to validate this measure, look at it, how it performs with other measures, and really look at how to implement it, um, implementation sort of things. Um, and then I'm a biostatistician on um, three new grants um, that are starting, and you can see there's sort of a cross 
um, a broad range of diseases and um, outcomes, um, including um, informed consent in older populations. So part of when we do research is we consent people to participate in research, but then how do you consent people that may have cognitive disabilities and all those types of things. Um, and then the last one is actually um, one of the Cancer Moonshot grants. Um, so I don't know how much you've read about that or heard about it um, in the news, but we're gonna really be using electronic medical record data to identify patients who should be targeted for um, genetic testing um, for cancers and then figure out how to really implement those in real sort of care settings. Um, so I used to teach biostatistics for public health, <laughs> um, but starting this spring, I'll be teaching two new courses, Introduction to Data Management, System Computing, um, and then Survey Design, Analysis, and Reporting. And I wrote a book. <laughs> and I wrote a book. Great. Thanks, Melody. Okay. <laughs> hey, everyone. My name is Rumi Shinara, so I'm an assistant professor here at NYU, and now I'm starting my fifth year, so I've been here for a little while. Um, and I'm a, a little bit uniquely, I'm here in the college in biostats, and I'm also a professor at the Tandon School of Engineering and Computer Science, so you'll kind of see from the kind of work I do that we kind of um, are kind of, you know, bringing together methods, both in computer science and statistics for some uh, different types of data sources and problems. Um, so that so kind of my background is a little bit um, diff, uh, different. Also, studied engineering, computer science, and then um, for a while I was um, working in computational epidemiology. So this is where we kind of we're looking at some of these new data sources and got closer, more closely related to to this line of work. So to summarize, so some of the things, so I'm broadly interested in kind of these um, person-generated data sources. So you can think about nowadays, there's a lot of um, uh, ways that we can get data beyond surveys and government reports when thinking about um, health behaviors and risks and outcomes. So, you know, we mine social media, we look at um, other kind of internet and mobile connected tools. So whether it's like people reporting symptoms on an app or the wearables and tracking people. There's a lot of new statistical problems um, because uh, you know that arise out of the way that people use these data sources and kind of the human patterns um, of, of generating data. And so um, we also address those problems statistically but then combine them in kind of spatial and temporal models to understand how that um, contributes to disease um, in populations. And another interest of mine is um, from a few of my projects also, a lot of these data, they provide opportunity for um, uh, looking at things in different places, in different contexts, maybe because there aren't any infrastructure or just there's other problems. And so I have a lot of uh, collaborations in different parts of the world, um, and, and we kind of like learn from all of those to, to develop these methods. So I will uh, read over the you kind of see it just uh, brings out what, what I was talking about. Um, so just some example projects. Um, I've been doing a lot of work in, um, think, uh, think about things like influenza, which we all get affected by it every year, but it's something that we don't necessarily go to the doctor for, right? So it happens at home, and that's why these kind of data sources are useful because it's gonna help us capture things that we just don't get data on otherwise. So, that's really exciting. Um, <laughs> So that's something we've been working on, gener um, crowdsourcing data and bringing data on that, comparing it to what happens clinically. Um, other types of just more statistical issues, like because these data often provide really granular information, like really over time, what happens on a daily or sub-daily basis, or in space, like you know, block to block, so kind of like high granularity uh, models. Um, some of that work's been on, um, of course, uh, infectious diseases like influenza, but also thinking about our health behaviors on a more granular basis also, so how people use substances like alcohol and tobacco, um, and also just some of the, again, issues with um, some, some new data sources and tracking uh, people's health behaviors in terms of physical activity and other outcomes. So I've been teaching um, biostats um, for the undergrads, um, as well, I teach a course on data science um, at School of Engineering. So this is kind of exactly what I was talking about when we talk about some of the spatial statistics, temporal statistics. We also do some um, some introduction to supervised machine learning, and so hopefully we're going to try and build um, that you know that together with the, the public health uh, students, so we can 
not only have students take it, but actually it'd be great for all computer science students to meet you know, people who have more of a domain um, background and expertise in, you know, on the health side. Hi, my name is Stephanie. Um, <clears throat> I'm very different from what you just heard of. I actually went to Michigan and my undergraduate degree is in women's studies and psychology. Um, and then when I got to Columbia, I said I really like statistics. So my um, MPH is in sociomedical sciences with um, a focus on quantitative methods and statistics, and so is my um, DRPH. So in terms of um, statistics, I'm really interested in intensive longitudinal uh, designs and analyses. So these are designs that collect repeated measures um, um, on a semi-frequent basis over the course of a week or even a day or, or a month. And so you can really look at temporal ordering and understand the temporal associations between you know, uh, different behaviors, for example. Um, I'm also really interested in, I do a lot of um, data analysis for longitudinal cohort studies with count outcomes. Um, as it stands right now in the field, we're not great at providing really accurate uh, estimates for count outcomes of longitudinal um, um, data right now. So um, I apply and also um, do, um, you know, examine some kind of some measurement and statistics along this line to do look at these, you know, Poisson or I know I'm trying to say like not Poisson, <laughs> but these these longitudinal models to better specify them. Um, I also run the attachment and health disparities lab. This is my social science background, so I'm really interested in how uh, features of close relationships are associated with changes in adaptation in health and health behaviors among vulnerable populations, so racial and ethnic minorities um, and or sexual um, minorities. Um, and lastly, my new work as of a couple of years ago, I'm really interested in biological markers of minority stress. So now I, in my um, studies looking at these intensive optional designs, I incorporate biological markers of stress in the form of cortisol or you know, other markers of inflammation. And then I also do a few cross-sectional studies as well looking at other biological um, in terms of my grants right now, um, I have a lot going on in the lab. <laughs> um, um, even though I do a lot of secondary data analysis, these are all primary data analysis studies. And um, I basically you know, run these stress studies looking at stress and um, discrimination and stigma and how they affect behaviors um, on a daily basis. Um, and then I tweak the questions in different ways to look at resilient mechanisms, for example, um, and these other features of close uh, relationships like social support from romantic um, relationship ideation, things like that. Um, yes, so that's me in a nutshell. In terms of teaching, uh, so I am in, I'm a joint appointment in social behavioral sciences and biostatistics. So these are my biostatistics course. Um, between myself and um, Violet, who you'll hear from in a moment, we teach the regression one, the regression two, in the longitudinal class. And um, I used to, I currently teach intro biostats, but maybe not anymore because yeah. we're teaching all these other courses. Um, and then in social behavioral sciences, I teach the intro, intro course. Um, I'm, <laughs> um, I'm Chu Su, um, you can call me Violet. Um, my background is in psychology. Uh, um, I got my kid, um, bachelor's degree from China. And then after I came to the States, uh, I, I really missed the math part of my training because uh, I love uh, modeling, I love data, I love computation. So uh, I went to C. Davis to pursue our PhD degree in quantitative psychology so that, as you can see uh, later on, uh, my research and uh, my applied work re really reflect the combination of both. Um, my research interest, 
Um, so I should start uh, talking about this from psychology, stu uh, psych psychology study individual difference. Also, we are so interested in groups, how people change over time. That made me uh, concentrate my work on latent variable methods. So this concerns some um, phenomenon that we cannot directly measure uh, with some existing tool. Instead, we collect, uh, usually you, um, by using surveys, we can collect a lot of uh, items and then we extract the information based on those items. That's how we say we study uh, unmeasured variables or latent variables. And specifically, in terms of mathematical uh, statistical modeling, uh, I, I'm interested in developing and evaluating uh, uh, quantitative methods uh, like longitudinal data analysis, structural equation modeling, uh, missing data, because yeah, they are also uh, cannot be observed <laughs> directly, and psychometrics. So, um, so in addition to using existing uh, measurement tools, I help to develop and evaluate um, measures. Uh, another research. Uh, field I'm concentrated on is applied statistics. So uh, I like to apply those methods in, to solve the questions from real study. So I collaborated and also I'm still collaborating with uh, researchers from different areas like development, uh, um, like uh, prevention science, developmental psychology, clinical psychology, and also public health. Um, and recently I have been focused focusing my applied work in tobacco research because it reflects a lot of very interesting things in data like highly skewed data, longitudinal data, um, and, and also I, uh, I could develop my method in uh, study transition, which is also a very interesting thing, a very interesting topic in longitudinal study. So specifically, I, I'm evaluating patterns of conventional and emerging tobacco product use, for example, uh, like e-cigarette. It has been uh, dramatically increased um, in use, and it made a lot of parents uh, worry about that case. So I think we can use statistical tool to solve this problem in, in real life and help, uh, help to improve people's health. Oh, teaching. So, um, yeah, I teach a lot of classes. <laughs> I'm teaching um, biostats for public health uh, for undergraduate students and also graduate students. And uh, next semester, uh, semester, I will teach regression and multivariate modeling. And this class uh, actually has been split in two new courses. So one is linear regression model, another one is uh, categorical regression model. Also, I will teach the longitudinal data analysis in the class. Great. Thank you. Okay, so now we'll turn back to Melody, who will uh, talk about our programs. So, ooh, this is really loud. Um, <laughs> So if you um, study biostatistics, we hope that you will gain a set of skills, we call those competencies, um, by the time that you complete the program. Um, we have seven like major competencies that we hope all of our students obtain. Um, so I'm not gonna read them to you, but they're listed there. And a lot of them are about being able to work with data, being able to use data in public health, being able to work with software tools and all the kind of things that you would need for a real job. So our competencies are really based on the things that we would want if we were hiring someone um, to work for us. So right now we have the MBH program with the biostatistics concentration. It's a two-year program. It has a total of 47 credits. You take 18 credits of general public health courses. So you take all of the core, the five core public health discipline courses. Um, you also have additional readings courses, including um, an informatics course, which really tells you um, how to use like digital library services and, and other information. And then you have 15 credits of biostatistics concentration courses. Um, and these are the courses where we hope you get those seven competencies that I, that I talked about um, before. And then you get 10 credits of electives. So that's the fun part. Those are the classes that you want to take, not the classes you have to take. Um, and our electives fall into two groups. Group A is methods. You get three credits of methods. Um, and then group B is statistics. And you get um, seven credits of statistics. 
Um, and our students take courses all over the university, um, Steinhardt, Stern, um, the medical school. So it's really a chance to take classes um, that you want to take both in the College of Public Health, but also across um, the university. Um, and then we think of the MPH really as a practice degree. So as part of that, you have to do um, a practice experience. I think it's really good for students who are coming straight from undergrad, um, who've never worked before, because um, it's your chance to get some real sort of work experience. All of our students have to touch data as part of their practice experience, so you will have some real experience by the end um, of working. I'll talk about that more. And then um, the culminating experience is a, a master's thesis, um, which is a, a year-long course which culminates in a, in a thesis report. Um, so like I mentioned, you take a set of um, core public health courses, biostatistics, epidemiology, healthcare policy, public health management and leadership, um, global issues in social and behavioral health, um, global environmental health, and the essentials of public health biology. And that's really to give you a really good sense of a broad scope of what public health is, which is a really, really broad discipline that covers um, a lot of sort of subfields. <clears throat> and then you take your biostatistics concentration courses. Um, so you take data management and statistical computing, which will basically give you um, I serve a bunch of different software programs that different statisticians use to solve different problems. Um, and then you'll take the regression sequence, so regression one and two. Um, you'll take a class on um, survey um, data, just because we encounter a lot of survey data in public health, particularly from um, the, the health departments, but also from our government and other sort of secondary sources. And then lots of us collect um, survey data, and then you round it off with longitudinal um, analysis. So the applied practice experience is usually completed in the summer between your first and second years. It's 180 hours of work. Um, you get to pick the practice environment of your choosing. So I always tell students, go pick a practicum in the place where you think you want to work when you graduate, because it gives you a good sense of if that's really what you want to do when you graduate. Um, but students have gone all over. They've gone to the health department. They've gone to pharmaceutical companies. Um, they've gone to, um, they've stayed in sort of academic research centers. Um, but there's a lot of new opportunities, I think, for you guys. There's a lot of like health data startup companies, particularly in New York, which gives you guys a good chance. Um, and then there's other companies here like Google and Amazon, which will be coming to New York City soon, and they also have health arms. So I think there's a lot of chances for Biosat students to maybe not do things that have traditionally been done in Biosat, but also take on some new um, uh, projects. Um, you must actively work with data <laughs> and touch data and do things with data, massage it and love it and learn it, um, and gain skills related to those seven competencies that we want you to get. You must be supervised by someone else who also knows how to work with data, so you can't just like go work for someone who needs a statistician. Like You have to go work under the supervision of someone who really understands data, and then you submit two products of that. Um, that we evaluate to make sure that you're getting those competencies. So one of the competencies says use statistical software. So one of the things a lot of students submit is software code, showing that they know how to write software programs that do specific things. Um, and then you take your, you do your master's thesis in your second year. It's a two semester course. Uh, thesis one and thesis two each is two credits for a total of four credits. Um, and really I think of thesis as like learning how to write a manuscript, right? So you conduct a literature review, you do data analysis, you develop tables, figures, and images, and you basically write a report um, of the results. The nice thing about thesis is you get to select the topic that you want to work on. So it's your area of interest. Um, and then you're also paired with a faculty member who will mentor you um, through that process. And I think a lot of our students have tried um, and gotten publications out of their thesis because um, they've done some original work. So, um, our pending program, which we hope will be approved soon, is the new um, Masters of Science degree. It's more of a research-focused degree, so I said the MPH is more practice-focused. Um, so we're thinking students who want to go on further for like doctoral training or people who really want to work in a research-intensive um, environment. You take fewer public health courses and you really focus more on biostatistics and epidemiology courses. So this is for people who really want to understand study design and data collection and lots of ways to analyze data. Um, there's no uh, practice experience here, but these students will also have to do a thesis. Um, and then we're asking that when they take their electives, they pick a thematic area so that um, when you think about your electives, you're sort of getting a specialization in something so that when you go on the market, you can say, I have an MS in biostatistics, but I'm really good at um, data visualization or GIS or whatever it is that you decide um, to specialize in. And I also think this gives you 
a chance to maybe pick some things different. Some of us, we've talked about all the different paths that we took to get here and all of our different interests. So some of you may want to do social justice or some other things um, that may not be traditionally uh, biostat focused. Um, so you take the two um, core courses, which are just biostat and epi, and then you have lots of concentration courses, which are really um, a series of epidemiology courses and, and a slew of uh, biostatistics courses. So you're really well-rounded in terms of both epidemiology and biostat. Um, when you're completing this concentration. Those are our two programs. Any questions about that before I turn it over to the admissions folks? Hi everyone, I'm Zach. I'm in charge of admissions for the College of Global Public Health. Pleased to be with you here tonight to talk about how you might apply to one of these degree programs. So I break this up into four areas. First, we're gonna talk about basic eligibility questions. That is, who can apply to these programs. Then we'll talk about the actual procedural part of applying the admissions requirements, what you have to submit, and who those documents go to. We'll talk about the deadlines and the timeline for going through this process, and we'll talk a little bit about financial aid and ways of financing your education. Does that sound good? Good. <laughs> so in terms of eligibility, of course, the basic criterion is that all applicants have to have a US, or excuse me, a bachelor's degree or the equivalent in US terms. There aren't specific prerequisite courses per se, but I think evidence of quantitative competence is desirable, and I don't know if any, anybody wants to say anything about that. There's no specific requirements, but you should like to do quantitative stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and similarly with GRE and GPA, we don't do screening based on minimums. So it's not the case that if your GPA is below, you know, for example, a 3.0, if your GRE is below a certain percentile that you're not going to get reviewed, we employ a holistic review process, which means every application gets read in full in the context of the opportunities that that person has had. So rest assured that you know, we're not putting applications aside ever based on one metric, uh, a quantitative metric like the GRE <laughs> or the GPA. And similarly, there's no minimum work experience, and this, you know, these are questions we get a lot, which is why I put them on the slide, which is who is your ideal candidate? And that's, uh, you know, in a way, I can't give um, an accurate answer to that because there is not necessarily an ideal candidate. I think the faculty talked about the wide range of backgrounds and experiences they've come from, the paths they've taken here, and similarly, our students take uh, a really diverse set of pathways uh, into the MPH degree. So this is the admissions process in a nutshell, um, what you have to submit in order to apply to one of these programs. You have to apply through SOFIS. So, has, have we heard of SOFIS? SOFIS is the centralized application for schools and programs of public health. It's important to note that applying through SOFIS means you're not submitting much of anything to my office. In fact, you're submitting nothing to me. Uh, all the documents you're gonna submit are going to go to SOFIS. Uh, that will include official transcripts from each and every post-secondary institution you've attended, regardless of whether or not you've actually achieved a degree or qualification there. This is important to note because if SOFIS detects that you took, say, one statistics course at a community college, uh, maybe you transferred that credit to a university, but you didn't submit the original transcript from the institution you took the course at, they will actually hold your application and not deliver it to us. So in order to facilitate this process as efficiently as possible, I really recommend you order your transcript from every institution you can think of as early as possible and have them sent to SOFIS because they do have a way of slowing up your application based on what would seem like minor technicalities, but I've seen applications get hung up before and we really want to make sure that doesn't happen to any of you. You're also required to submit three letters of recommendation. This is also all done through the SOFIS application. You'll let SOFIS know who the recommenders are. SOFIS will generate an invitation to each of the recommenders to upload a recommendation on your behalf. We get a lot of questions about who the recommenders should be. There's no fixed formula. We don't have requirements. You know, for example, we don't require that two of the recommenders are academic, one professional. I, I think you can use your intuition about this. If you've been out of school for a while, uh, people tend to submit professional recommendations. If you're just coming out of undergraduate, your undergraduate studies, and you don't submit any academic references, that would be unusual, and um, maybe it would sound a note of caution to the reviewer. So you'll just wanna use whatever combination of recommenders makes the most sense to you, and also make sure that they can write you the strongest possible recommendation. 
Uh, I always encourage um, students who are asking for recommendations to, uh, and, and this is maybe the fact that we chuckle at this because I'm very direct about it, but when I was applying to graduate school, I said, can you write me the strongest possible recommendation? And then I just searched their face for a second, like after I asked that. If there was kind of a flinch or kind of the eyebrow went up a little bit, then I thought, you know what, I'll, maybe I'll get a recommendation from someone else. Because you really want people who know you and who know why you want to do this and who understand why you want to do it. And you want to be sure that they're going to write you a really strong letter. We do require uh, the graduate record examination for the GRE. Um, the official code, uh, the ETS code that you'll use to transmit your scores is not the NYU code, so don't be fooled by this. It's actually the SOFIS NYU code, and it's 8752. So that's an important number. It's in all of our application materials online, so you'll see it. You want to make sure you send the test to SOFIS NYU, not just NYU, because then it will be transmitted to some other department at NYU, and I won't be able to retrieve it. And if you are not a native English speaker and you didn't receive a degree um, in which the primary language of instruction was English, then you will be required to submit the test of English as a foreign language or the TOEFL exam. And generally, and we don't use a fixed minimum for this either, but we're typically looking for a score of 100 or better on that exam. Any questions about these requirements? Or shall we just move on? Excellent. So we do employ a rolling admissions timeline, which means we make decisions as we get applications. And that suggests that the earlier you apply, the earlier you'll get a decision. And um, accordingly, the earlier you apply, the fewer other applicants we're reviewing at that time, and you'll get a decision much sooner. So as the cycle progresses, the timeline from application submission to decision will get longer as we get backed up. So it, it is in your best interest to apply earlier, I think, to uh, get a decision sooner and start feeling good about um, what we've accomplished. Um, I will say that it doesn't change your chances of getting in, which is a, a corollary question I get a lot. Um, applying later doesn't mean you have less of a chance of being admitted, and I think it's important to keep that in mind as well. The uh, final deadline for fall enrollment is February 1st. Uh, we are sometimes able to go past that deadline, but I can't guarantee it, so the safest thing to do is to get your application in well in advance of that deadline especially because SOFIS can slow you down. So you'll want to allow ample time for all of your materials to arrive. And um, to be on the safe side, I, was apply, I would apply as early as realistically possible. Um, April 15th is sort of the final decision date for the fall cycle. Uh, so we aim to get everybody a decision no later than then. Really, if you had applied um, you know, earlier in the cycle, you would have had a decision uh, uh, much quicker. Uh, the turnaround can be anywhere from two to three weeks at the best to six to eight weeks at the longest, and that's during a peak period of admission and submission. Um, but I wouldn't expect that most people would have to wait a long time for their decision. Uh, we aim to turn them around uh, really quickly. The faculty are typically uh, really good about doing that. And again, just keep in mind that you'll want to give yourself a buffer um, for GRE score results to be transmitted. For SOFIS, do, uh, what they do is they, they verify your transcript, and the verification process means they painstakingly match what you've entered into the application against what the transcripts you've submitted say. And that can take them up to two to three weeks during peak periods of the cycle. So you want to keep that in mind in terms of the timeline. So let's talk about financial aid because everybody you know, asks themselves rightly how they can financially make graduate education a possibility. And there's a lot of uh, resources and opportunities out there. Uh, the college itself does offer program scholarships. These are merit-based scholarships based on faculty review of your application. Um, they are competitive. Uh, they can range anywhere from $10,000 annually to $20,000 annually. Um, we will make this determination at the time of admission into the program. If you're admitted, your admit letter will actually tell you what your scholarship is, so you'll know upfront you don't have to file the FAFSA, which is the application for federal student aid for this because it's not need-based, and it's available to international students on the exact same basis as domestic students. We are, I'll say, fairly generous in terms of our scholarship program. We can't guarantee every student scholarship, but last year, this past academic year, 76.5% of our master's student body were receiving some kind of scholarship from the college, and so we think that's, that's pretty good. There are other forms of financial aid out there. If you are a US citizen or a permanent resident, um, the main form of financial aid people take advantage of are federal loans, subsidized and unsubsidized direct loans, which means that the federal government is lending you money to help finance your graduate education at relatively favorable interest rates. 
Um, there's also federal work study, which is essentially working on campus. And for these kinds of programs, you will have to file a FAFSA. And the FAFSA, again, is the Federal Application for Student Aid. It's available every October uh, for the following year, so it's available now. If you think you're going to be pursuing any kind of graduate education for which you're going to need to access federal or direct loans, the FAFSA should be filed as quickly as possible. If you are a return Peace Corps volunteer, we also participate in a special program called the Coverdell Fellows Program. I don't know if we have any Peace Corps volunteers in the room, so I won't belabor it. But if you're a veteran, we also participate in the Yellow Ribbon Veteran Matching Program, which allows us to match some federal government funds to help um, severely reduce the cost of, of the education here. ASPPH, which is the Association of Schools and Programs of Public Health, has made a very useful uh, resource, um, and all the schools and programs have chipped in to help make this. Um, it's called Financing Your Degree, and it's a database of scholarship and financial aid opportunities, including tips and different tricks uh, to try to obtain these scholarships. It's organized by affinity group and by type, so you can it's, it's a searchable database. Um, so, of course, there are a million different scholarships that are geared towards a million different communities and interests and backgrounds, and so you can sort of go in there and plug in your own interests and your own background and see what kind of scholarships are out there. They've also made a video um, called How to Finance a Public Health Degree. It's hosted by the Director of Admissions at Columbia, but it's still a good video. <laughs> it's a little bit too much it, but, uh, I do recommend it. It's on YouTube. It's easy to find if you go to YouTube and search for it. And it can be helpful to just sort of orient you to the landscape of financial aid opportunities that are out there. So in terms of financial aid, to give kind of a summation of it, the reality is, is that the scholarships do not cover the, the full cost of the education year. I think that's probably clear. Um, so students put this together through a number of resources. Um, there's the scholarship. The reality is, is that most students, the vast majority of students who are U.S. citizens and permanent residents are taking advantage of federal direct loan programs. These are an important means of financing your education. Uh, <laughs> federal work study can be part of that, and so can working on campus, because I think it's important to note that the majority of our courses are in the evenings at the College of Global Public Health, and that's important because it allows opportunities during the day for internship work and for paid work just to support yourself, and a lot of students do that. Of course, if you're already working, your employer may offer tuition assistance, and then we have family assistance up, up here. And of course, that's the old standby is the people who have families who are willing and or able um, to help them do this. A couple of other factors to keep in mind. We talked about external scholarships. I'll, you know, I'll briefly mention public service loan forgiveness. Um, some students blanch at taking out federal direct loans, and I understand that everybody's got sort of a, a, a different a feeling about taking out student debt, and that can be influenced by whether or not you have a lot of debt from your undergraduate studies, or whether or not you feel comfortable taking on more. Um, public service loan forgiveness is a program whereby the federal government, um, for certain professions, uh, will take your federal loans after 10 years of making the minimum payment and discharge the remaining balance. So this is useful for a field like public health because almost every job you could imagine in the field actually qualifies for public service loan forgiveness. Essentially, if you work at a nonprofit, you qualify for a public service loan forgiveness program. The details are complicated, so I'm not suggesting that everybody here automatically qualifies for this program. So you'll want to look into it yourself. And that's ultimately what I'm suggesting. But I do think the idea of it takes a little bit of the sting out of federal direct loans, this idea that you know after 10 years of, of minimum payments, um, you have the possibility of having the balance discharged. There are also now income-based repayment plans, which make the idea of federal loans a little more palatable. Years ago, when I started in this field, and maybe before you to you your memory of this, when for-profit colleges were becoming a big topic of debate, um, people were graduating and having to make enormous payments against their student loans, much more than they earned. So it was this huge ballooning problem. So the federal government instituted these income-based repayment plans, which ensure that when you pay back your federal loans for graduate school, you're never paying back more than a certain proportion of what you're earning to keep you from drowning in those kinds of monthly payments. So we don't hear those kinds of horror stories anymore. So I think that those things, those are those are topics to research yourself. Um, the federal government's educational loans website is actually quite comprehensive, and they have very helpful staff that you can always call and talk to about these issues. So uh, as Dr. Batinsky mentioned, we wanted to leave some time for some questions and answers, and I'll just point out before we do that, that we have a lot more information on the website, so do visit us on the web because that's where you'll find a link to the online application. You'll find the course sequences for the degrees we've mentioned here tonight.
You'll find descriptions of all of our courses in the course catalog, detailed admission instructions, there's an FAQ, there's student profiles. I should mention that there are student ambassadors that are available to uh, uh, talk with you. And we have our, their email addresses published on the site, so you can always email them directly. And we do want you to keep in touch with any questions you might have. We can arrange class visits if you want to come sit in on classes. Uh, we try to make that easy. You can meet with us in the admissions office. You can do it on the same day. Um, you can get in touch with current students, ask any questions you might have. That's our email address. We have a very active Facebook site, which if you are not liked or liking it, following it, whatever kids do nowadays, uh, do that because you'll hear a lot about the events in the biostatistics department and in other departments. And if you want to get a sense of the community, I think it's, it would, and, and you can, it would be wonderful to have you at some of these events.